Okay, let's get going. Uh, this is another first Wednesday, my favorite Wednesday of every month. Uh, we have a special treat tonight. We're going to learn about wolves, and I don't want to spend much of the introduction talking about Steve and Paula, other than to, to pitch a little bit their, the nonprofit they started, the Apex Protection Project, uh, because of what it does on behalf of wolves, and it's a terrific project, but they're not really the stars. The stars tonight are the animals. And um, we're going to have an interesting program. And then, as always, there'll be questions afterwards. And then you go out, go out on the bottom, and there's an opportunity for um, discussion and asking questions. And now, what I want to say about wolves is I've been involved with them as a conservationist for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and you're going to learn about them. They're loyal. They're family-oriented. They're curious. They're intelligent. Uh, they're amazing animals, but so are a lot of other wildlife, and, and it bothers me that in Idaho and Montana and Wyoming, they're hunting and trapping and snaring wolves. Uh, they're calling it management. Uh, we put a scientific paper out on the tables here if you want to read it. Uh, it's been peer-reviewed and everything that sort of challenges whether it's really sensible management. But the real thing is about wolves is that I think we all know that we're more human because of our we're more human because of music. We're more human because of literature. We're also more human because of animals, because of wolves, because of otters, because of octopus. We're more human when we understand them and get ourselves outside of ourselves. And um, I think tonight you're going to see what's so special about wolves and how they make us more human. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the lights down and I'm gonna ask, make sure everybody's sitting and be very quiet, okay? I could even say, shut up and be quiet. But so the lights are gonna go down and be very quiet and enjoy the program. humans have the opportunity of hearing firsthand in their lifetimes. It just so happens to be our alarm every morning. <laughs> At 5 a.m., it doesn't stop until we get up, we stick our heads out the door, and we greet every single one of them by name, kind of like an episode of the Waltons. Good morning, Sarge. Good morning, Kona. Good morning, Neo. Good morning, Ryder. Good morning, Rogue. Oh, hello, Miss Selena. You get the point. <laughs> we have 16 of them, so it takes a little time. And then as soon as we've greeted them all, they all go back to sleep, <laughs> which gives us a chance to make our coffee, throw our clothes on, and get ready for the morning hike. We never intended on living in the middle of nowhere with a pack of wolves. 
but life had other plans for us. So today we're going to tell you our story, the story of our pack, and about the plight that wolves are dealing with in the wild. I'm Paula Ficara, and this is my husband, Steve Wastel, and we're the co-founders and directors of Apex Protection Project, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to protecting wolves and wolf dogs through educational experiences, rescue, and advocacy. Our vision is to live in a world where future generations have the wolf and all species highly valued respected, protected for the place they rightfully hold on the planet, the balance they bring to their ecosystems, and for the beautiful lessons they offer humanity. Over the past 13 years, we have helped either rescue, rehabilitate, or socialize close to 400 wolves and wolf dogs. What does that mean? That means we rescue wolves and wolf dogs that were born into the, into the captive bred exotic pet trade. And people buy them as pets. Once in a while it works out, but the majority it does not. Why do people do this? Everybody wants to be Jon Snow, right? You know, walking down the street with your wolf. But the problem is, your wolf doesn't want to walk down the street. It doesn't like your friends. It doesn't like cars. It doesn't like trees blowing in the wind. It doesn't like flags. It howls at night. It chases the next door neighbor's dogs and cats and chickens go missing. It guards its food. It has prey drive. It isn't meant, it's not meant to live on your couch. It's meant to eat your couch. And they do a lot. We're on our fourth. Um, so people buy them, and I'm not saying that some people don't have success with these guys, but it is a lifestyle, it is a full-time job. It's like having a two-year-old child with teeth for the rest of your life, or their life at least. And most people are not ready for that. So they buy them, and after about a year and a half, they either dump them in the pound, or they worse, they tie them up in the backyard. Guess what happens when you tie a wild animal up in the backyard? We get three to seven emails every single week, and we're tiny. We work with a network of 50 rescues around the country, and all of them are full all the time. So we do what we can to pull them from different pounds. We transport them to locations where they're going to be safe, and we try to rescue them. The ones that come to live with us at Apex, well, they spend the rest of their lives with our family and our pack. Wolves in the wild are being slaughtered at an unimaginable rate right now. So we also focus heavily on education, educating as many people as possible about the true nature of wolves, you know, getting rid of the negative myths that surround them, hopefully changing the attitude towards them to try and help and save them. We do free school presentations, classroom crashes. Um, we are able to stream live from the sanctuary where we're able to reach people from all over the world at the same time. We also have educational experiences at our sanctuary and we do other things. We have an event that we throw every year. It's a conference called Sedona Wolf Week where we have lecturers and workshops where people can come and actually learn more about wolves and how to fight for them. And then we also advocate. We work with our legislators, teaching them and helping them in understanding how important the wolf is, how important the species is to their environment so that hopefully they'll pass laws that protect them. So, we can't do this work by ourselves, obviously. It's a lot. And we need a lot of help. And we do have a lot of help. We're very lucky. We have, we're 90% volunteer driven. And both by two-legged and four-legged, as you can see. <laughs> and they're in the shade a little bit. It's hard to see them. But we do have two of our ambassadors today. When we rescue these guys, if they enjoy going on adventures and interacting with the public, they become ambassadors for their kind. And today we have our ambassadors, Thor and Loki. And if you can see them, Thor is handling Brennan. <laughs> and Loki is handling our pet care manager, Betty. <laughs> and then we also have Wiggy and Darcy, 
who are here to add a little moral support in case the boys get shy, but from emotional what I can support see, humans. emotional support humans. <laughs> As you can see, I think they're doing just fine. I'm just gonna take yeah. a nap. <laughs> I was actually gonna say when we were rehearsing today, I was like, well, maybe they'll be a little uncomfortable in here. I, I think guess, they're I doing not. okay. <laughs> if they do and they start getting a little freaked out, which they don't look like they're going to do, they're very comfortable around people most of the time. But there's a lot of people here and it's a big crowd. So if they feel like they need to leave, they might leave in the middle of the presentation. But I but think- we also are so lucky because our emotional support humans, our volunteers, we have a ton of them out here in the audience today. They are literally our family. And uh, just for a brief moment in family style, we'd like to embarrass them by making them just make themselves known. Can you guys stand Where up? Where are you? Just stand Where up. Are you? Just hi. stand up. Oh, they're so chicken. Yeah, Thank right. you, Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> so we are not scientists, but we've spent the last 13 years living and working hands-on with these amazing creatures. And we feel we have a lot of valuable information that we want to share with you today. So we developed this presentation for this particular event, and it's called The Humanity of Wolves. Why the humanity of wolves, you ask? <laughs> so, yeah. When biologists and scientists speak about wolves, they speak about, well, the biology and the science and the facts, which is so very important but I believe one of the reasons, one of the things they, they leave out is the complex emotional life of a wolf. And there's a reason for that. I mean, in science, you have to have logical proven data. And when it comes to the complex emotional life of a wolf, there's not a lot of data out there. But, you know, in other species, I mean, Jane Goodall knew it. If you go to wolves, Rick McIntyre in Yellowstone and all the wolf watchers, they know it. If you had a relationship with a canine, you know it. Even the people that are killing wolves, they know it. At the International Wolf Symposium in Minnesota late last year, we had the opportunity of listening to some amazing, fascinating lectures by some of the most renowned wolf biologists in the world, filled with data that had been gathered over years of study. But one of the things that seemed to be missing, like Steve mentioned, was, was the lack of, of talking about the emotional life of the wolf. And it seemed like they were skirting around the issue a little bit, some obvious uh, you know, instances where they could have said, oh, the wolves were, were playing and seemed happy. But they didn't say it. And for good reason, again, like he said, you know, happy is really hard to, to validate. How do you prove it? Love is challenging to prove. Sadness is difficult to chart or graph. So as much as we could feel them wanting to admit it, they didn't. But then again, perhaps they were concerned that they would uh, you know, be accused of anthropomorphizing or humanizing by the scientific community. Wolves feel happy. Wolves feel sad. Wolves feel pain and loss, and until humans are ready to admit that, they will always be in danger. Could it be that not acknowledging another being's deep emotional life, it makes them so much easier to kill? There is no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental faculties. Animals like man manifestly feel pain, pleasure, happiness, and misery. Happiness is never better exhibited than by young animals such as puppies when playing together like our own children. You know who said that? Charles Darwin, back in 1871. I think that guy might have known a few things, you know? <laughs> humanity. The definition of humanity according to Merriam-Webster, is compassionate, sympathetic, or generous behavior or disposition, the quality or state of being humane. So, 
at the risk of being accused of anthropomorphizing. 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 It took me so many hours <laughs> to get that word down. At the risk of that. <laughs> thank you, guys. My support team back here. Back in 2000, it was the spring of 2009 when we met our first wolf dog. And writer and scientist Aldo Leopold said, to look into the eyes of the wolf is to see your own soul. I think I believe he was right, because just being in the presence of these guys, it changes you. It brings out something primal. It reminds you that has changed so much since the birth of modern society. You know, before that, man and wolf evolved together for almost 35,000 years. That was also the day that we started volunteering at a young local wolf dog rescue. And to be honest, none of us knew what the heck we were doing. I'm not gonna joke. <laughs> Steve and I especially had no idea. We didn't know the first thing about wolves or wolf dogs, and we definitely didn't know what was going on with wolves in the wild. Come on, I fancy myself a wolf whisperer. I'd read all the books. I was gonna be the alpha. You know, and after like two days, I got so schooled, I realized I had a whole lot to learn. <laughs> it was also really embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> but the next few months, we decided to really hone in, study, research, and also work hands-on with these amazing creatures. But little did we know that in a few months, we would meet the being who would change our lives forever. Her name was Taboo. And if you've ever come to the Apex Sanctuary for a tour or one of our experiences, you will know that before we start our tour, we stand by the statue of Taboo and we tell her story just like we did when she was alive. Taboo was the alpha of the Apex pack. And contrary to popular belief, the alphas are not the biggest and the strongest. The alphas are just mom and dad. They are the parents. Dr. David Meesh, the grandfather of wolf biology, wrote a book many, many moons ago. And he spent a lot of time trying to get that book unpublished because the scientific data in it was not accurate. We saw him in a conference recently, and he begged people not to use the word alpha anymore because it made it assume that wolves were fighting to get to the top, that they were the top dog, and they're not. They're just mom and dad. And guys, I know you know this already, but mom's in charge. <laughs> Just like a lot of cultures there. Major article. Taboo, if you came hiking with her, when we went on the hike, we would tell people Taboo will always be in the back. She'll make her part of her pack and she'll follow you and make sure that you're safe. People didn't believe it every single time. And back in the day, you know, some of the scientists would see the big male in the front and the female in the back and maybe assume that she was subordinate to him. But what does a good mother do? A good mother keeps her eyes on her family. She watches over her pack to make sure everybody's safe. What does a good leader do? A good leader leads from the back. And Taboo, if you fell behind just a little bit, she would give you a nudge up the butt, make sure you kept going. And that nudge, that nudge changed so many people's lives because they realized in that moment that this being was making them a part of her pack, that she was protecting them, that she was keeping everybody together. It was life-changing for some people. We rescued Taboo after she was tied up in a backyard for a year of her life. Not because the people were particularly mean or cruel, but because they were afraid of her. She had what was called fear aggression. All aggression comes out of fear. But they couldn't take her out on a leash because when they did, she would try to attack everything she saw because she couldn't run away. So when Paula and I rescued her, like I said earlier, we didn't plan on living in the middle of nowhere with a pack of wolves. We just wanted to find Taboo, a friend. And so we set off on this journey. We studied and we learned and we studied with some of these people that were so-called experts from TV and they cost us $500 an hour only to tell us to lock her up in a cage and don't put her near children, but we didn't believe that. So we took her everywhere where there was dogs. There's a place called Runyon Canyon in Hollywood. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Everybody who's everybody goes there with their dog. And back then, 
everybody was on leash. So we would take Taboo every single morning. And she would be like trying to get to all the little dogs. And Paula would walk in front and she'd say, please, please. Um, she's, she's learning. She's, she's been abused and neglected. And we're working with her. And you know, after a couple of weeks of people thinking we were completely freaking nuts, they started to root for Taboo. They were like, Taboo, go Taboo, go Taboo. Can Taboo meet Buffy? And I'm like, no, no, Taboo will eat Buffy. Um, <laughs> We lived in our apartment and we brought her home from the sanctuary every single night. We had to board up our windows so she couldn't get to the dogs outside. We had a chain link fence between the kitchen and the bedroom so she couldn't get to the cats. One of us slept on the sofa bed, the other one slept in the bedroom. This went on forever. It was crazy town. One day we're walking through Runyon Canyon and I said, one day Taboo is going to walk through Runyon Canyon off leash. And we laughed. We're like, never going to happen. A year and a half later, Taboo was walking through Runyon Canyon off leash. She was going to dog parks. She was playing with all the dogs in the neighborhood and she was sleeping with our cats. I finally got to sleep with Paula again. It was amazing. <laughs> Everything was amazing and all the things that we thought we taught her, she was actually teaching us. It was a beautiful time. And then, then we got kicked out of our apartment for having a wolf. And um, we moved out to the middle of nowhere where we live now. We thought our life was over. We thought it was just everything was falling apart. It turned out that our life was just beginning. And then people started bringing us our wolf dogs because now we had a reputation for socializing these wild things. And the first one to come was Kona. Kona, he was just a yearling when his human brought him to us. His human tried to give him the best life he possibly could, but as you just learned, it is incredibly difficult. And in the end, he wasn't able to give Kona what he needed. But on that first day, when Kona met Taboo, she was smitten, and she took him under her wing. And before we knew it, in two months, she taught him everything that it took us two years to teach her. It was unbelievable. We hike off leash in the mountains. He was off leash in, in no time, coming back, waiting when we fell behind. And then daily, we would watch her, kind of teaching him the ropes, teaching him a little bit of wolf etiquette, you know, not to, not to play with too much dominance or aggression, to be, you know, more gentle around certain things. And watching this, watching her teach him in this way was just fascinating. We imagined what it might be like to be Rick McIntyre, renowned wolf interpreter of Yellowstone, out there in the wilderness, studying the wild packs of, I mean, he has had his eyes on wolves, wild wolves, more than any other human in history. Matter of fact, in one of his recent books, The Reign of 21, the story of the life of one of the most revered alpha males in, in Yellowstone, there's a story about a wolf named Eight. And Eight was kind of a young guy, not really old, didn't have a ton of experience, but he ended up coming across a pack who had just lost the father to being shot and killed, leaving the mother and a new litter of puppies. Well, he joined the pack, became the alpha male of that pack, and adopted those puppies as if they were his own. And he had a reputation for being incredibly benevolent. And he even once had gotten into a huge to the death fight with a rival alpha male. And when it was time to kill the, the male he had defeated, he stopped and he actually let the male run away. And that's, that's pretty amazing. And 21 was one of those pups and he and his litter watched eight learned from eight. And when 21 was finally two and a half, he followed in eight's footsteps. He went and he joined a fatherless pack, became the father and adopted their puppies as his own. And that was the famous Druid pack. So then Rick got to really watch 21. And, and this is part of why he was so revered. He literally showed the same empathy that he had learned from his father. So if there was a pup who was injured and he couldn't go and help hunt, 21 would make sure that food was brought back and he would feed that pup. 
And if there was a pup who was being picked on by his, by his siblings or wasn't feeling well, he would take the time to spend time with that pup or to you know, nurture him by licking his face. It was really amazing to watch. He also followed in his father's footsteps by never killing a defeated rival. Empathy. A year had passed at Apex since Kona came, and we rescued Thor and Loki. They were three and a half weeks old and came from a horrible backyard breeding situation. Both of them were very sick. Their mother was sick but was rushed to the ER and she made it also. But we brought them back to Apex. We'd never rescued puppies before. Normally we rescue them at one, two, three years old when they've been tied up in a backyard. We didn't, have, we didn't know what to do. I was running around Target looking for teats all with the mothers. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on around here. It was really difficult. And our hats go off to all of you parents out there because we had to get up every two hours and feed them a wolf formula for like six weeks. I mean, you guys have to do it for a lot longer than that. So our hats go off. But what the most amazing thing was that taboo, as you can see there, and Kona, they brought them into their family immediately, just like 21 did, just like 8 did. Taboo became the mom to these pups. It was the most amazing thing to watch. Kona became like the big brother. And we have this video, it's just a little slice of life. We took them hiking, like we do every day, and they were all off leash, and even the puppies were off leash because they stayed with their family. And we have a little short video the wind's a little loud, so they might mute it. Um, but this is a short video, and I'll talk you through it as we go so you can kind of see what they're doing. It's really beautiful. So we're on the hike, and this is Loki. And watch him, he throws himself on the floor, and Taboo comes running over to make sure he's okay, like a good mom. In a moment, he'll go up and wiggle around Kona, and Kona will put his head in his mouth and kind of show him that I'm the boss, I'm your big brother, I got you. Which they always loved when he did that. There you go. <laughs> Makes them feel safe, actually. And then Boo, watch Taboo right now. She, she says, come on, let's go. And they all go run and play. <laughs> she was a wonderful mom. Love. In Yellowstone, 21 had joined the Druid Pack, and eventually, he ended up joining and partnering with, uh, with sorry, with 42. All these numbers. If only they didn't <laughs> 42. <it>. 42. <laughs> And she was also really amazing. And under 21 and 42's uh, leadership, the Druid Pack thrived. Both wolves left with, led with patience and benevolence, and their love affair was renowned. It was legendary amongst wolf watchers worldwide. I mean, people were constantly watching them snuggling and nuzzling and smooching and, and going on long walks together, all the while caring for their family. When we moved to the middle of nowhere, we brought a guy that was dubbed Vicious with us from the sanctuary that we worked at before. His name was Merlin, and Paula and I were two of the people that really could work with him on a daily basis, but he had a lot of issues with people and trust and also with other animals, just like Taboo. So we asked if he could come with us to Apex, and they said yes, of course, because they felt like we could give him the best life. So we brought him back and Taboo befriended him. And they didn't become friends right away because Merlin really did have trust issues, but she kind of understood that. And she was patient with him and loving with him. And we walked them every day on leash. We never let them off leash because we didn't trust him at the time not to get upset about something. He was a very emotional guy. And Taboo was so patient with him and loving with him. And we hoped maybe they would make a friendship because he didn't really have any friends, just like she didn't have any friends. A year and a half later, something happened, and we just happened to catch it on video. It was the day 
the first day we've ever seen Merlin play in the two or three years that we'd actually known him from that sanctuary to ours. It was the first time he lightened up, and it was the moment that they fell in love. And we have a very short clip of this. We drop the leaves, and you might even hear us crying in the background. You see me cheering. I mean, this was a big day for everyone. And so we just wanted to share this with you. This is what love looks like wolf style. You're so gentle with him. Now, both just under nine years old, which is twice the average lifespan of a wolf in Yellowstone, 21 and 42 had been together for six years every single day, 70% of their lives. Rick compared them to being like some married couples who have been together for decades. They've grown old together, but they're still best friends and lovers. And on this particular day, he was able to capture the most beautiful moment between the two. 21 and 42 were kind of flirting, a bit of a ways from the rest of the pack. And he observed 42 put her head over his back in a flirtatious manner. And then he responded after a breeding tie, he ended up showing lots of care and love by licking her face. And then they snuggled up and bedded down for the night to go to sleep. Everything was peaceful that night when he left the pack and headed home. It was the next morning and right after watching that beautiful moment Rick got word that 42 had been killed by, arrival, by rival wolves. 21 was never the same again. He spent all of his time alone. He didn't help the pack hunt. He uh, traveled many, many miles in search for her, a howling, a lone howl, hoping to hear a response, and he never did. And four months later, he quietly climbed the mountain to where their pack would spend their late summer, their rendezvous site. And he went over to where he had bedded down with his love so many times. He laid down and he died. Taboo and Merlin had the opportunity to grow old together. And at the ripe old age of 15 and a half, Merlin went to sleep and he too passed away. Kind of like we all wish we could, right? Taboo was never really the same after that. She was more melancholy. She wasn't participating with the pack the same way. And then one day after an evening hike, two months after Merlin died, she came back and she refused to eat her dinner. We knew something was wrong. She'd never done that before, so we rushed her to the vet. Only two months before, she had been to the vet for a full checkup. She'd had a scan and everything, and nothing was wrong with her. She was in perfect health. It turns out over that two months, she had developed a very fast and aggressive cancer. She was rushed into a surgery that night and she never came home. After that, it seemed that our pack was, was lost without her. They were down, their howl was completely off. We were all heartbroken. And Steve and I actually, you know, we thought, well, I wonder if someone from the pack was gonna step into Taboo's shoes. We thought, well, it was gonna be Kona. That makes sense. But Kona, he's a little too emotional. He doesn't have the patience. He turned the role down. He didn't want it. 
You know, he, he's more comfortable and, and better as the big brother, the right hand man, the enforcer. And without his alpha, he went into a deep depression, which lasted quite a while. He didn't want anybody to bother him. He, did, he was grumpy. He didn't want to go on any adventures or participate in presentations, which he had loved to do. He just wanted to be left alone. So we honored that, and we gave him some space. And we continued to wonder what was going to happen with the pack. But then, Loki wanted to take a shot at the title. As you can see, Loki's always wanted to be the boss of somebody ever since he was a baby. <laughs> so first he challenged Selena. Didn't go well. He got his booty kicked. And he challenged Kona. That was bad. He wasn't going about it the right way. He was being a bully. He was trying to muscle his way to the top. And then one person who did not want to be the alpha, who wanted nothing to do with all of this nonsense, was actually chosen by the pack. He didn't want anything to do with it because he had IBD. He's, he was kind of, you know, trying to deal with this illness. And, but he was the most, he was the one that was right for the, for the choice. And that was Thor. Fast asleep down there. Sleepy head. <laughs> <laughs> He's the alpha, he could do that. <laughs> Thor had all the qualities that Taboo had passed down to him. I taught him, he's benevolent and loving and firm. He's very political. He doesn't have to challenge people, he just shows them that he's strong. And even when Sarge, our oldest, gets real dominant with him and puts his head over him and starts growling at him, Thor doesn't fight back, he doesn't need to, he doesn't need to prove himself, he just walks away. He can go in every enclosure with every one of our pack. And he's just literally Taboo's son. And I guess you're asking, how? How did we know? How did we know? They told us, of course. <laughs> we have a half acre turnout. That's basically a big play area that's fenced in that the pack goes and plays in with different friends all day. And on this particular day, we took Thor up and he went in and he sniffed around and went and laid down in the shade. And then we brought up Kona and Kona had a spring in his step. And he kind of trotted over to Thor, and all of a sudden, he got down real low. And Kona doesn't get down low for anyone. <laughs> and when he got down low, he licked under Thor's chin. And Steve and I literally almost fell over. We went, oh my god, it's Thor, it's Thor, Thor is the new alpha, oh my gosh. But then, something even cooler happened. Kona kind of trotted away, and Thor got up. And he went over to Kona, got down low, and licked under Kona's chin, as if to say, all right, I took on this role. I didn't want it, but I'm going to do it. But I really respect you still, showing honor to him because he raised him. I mean, who could have been a better choice, right? But don't feel sorry for Loki. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> Last year, we rescued the big bear 15, and six of them, they were puppies from a backyard breeding situation, just like Thor and Loki came from. And the six of them came to Apex, and we helped raise them, nurse them back to health until we found placement for them. And Loki found his calling. Loki became the nanny. <laughs> the best nanny you have ever seen is a very important job in a wolf pack. You get to take care of the kids. He was so proud of those little kids. He cleaned them, and he played with them, and he taught them manners, and he disciplined them, because he's good at that. And they followed him everywhere. He walked around like Mother Duck, and they'd all follow him behind. And he just loved those puppies. And just like maybe a human who was younger and maybe a little rebellious when they were young, then all of a sudden gets responsibility. He took his job very, very seriously, and he took care of them so, so well that when we started placing them in, in different places, um, we kept two of them. We kept Gray and Pesci because Loki loved them so much and we wanted to honor him. We called him Daddy Loki and he was so proud. I would tell him every day that Taboo would be proud of you because you've grown into a fine young man, which he has. 
He even has this awkward family photo. <laughs> he even has his own little pack now. You got Loki here, you got Pesci here, you got Gray here, and over here is Strider, who was rescued at the same age as Gray and Pesci from an incredibly abusive situation. He needed a lot of rehabilitation, and we happened to have puppies, so we took him so he could join the family, and Loki took him under his wing too. And over here we've got Neo, and we've got Rogue, who were rescued separately, and they became a couple, and they adopted Neo, and they adopted Strider. And Neo turned into this father figure also. But when Loki goes in that enclosure, he is the Fonz. <laughs> Everybody thinks he's so cool. They come and they lick under his muzzle and he growls. He's, like, rah, rah. he's really found himself. We don't even let Thor go in there because, well, we don't want Thor to steal his thunder. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Excuse the pun. But yes, <laughs> he has his own family now. And we're so very proud of him. And the boys, just like in wild wolf packs, sometimes, you know, siblings, they kind of rule the pack. Maybe one of them is the alpha and the other one is kind of the right-hand man. And this is kind of what's happened with our pack now. Thor and Loki are kind of the ones that are in charge. So. So, in conclusion, perhaps, you know, it could be argued that all of these emotions and feelings in wolves that we're talking about don't exist. But we see them every single day with our pack. And Rick and his wolf watching team, they see it every day in Yellowstone. And biologists studying wolves on a regular basis, they see it. So knowing what you know about families, sons, daughters, loves, children, these are the facts. This is what's going on right now in our country. These are the latest numbers, except this number in the last four days has changed to 119. In Montana and Idaho alone, the rules and regulations are enough to turn your stomach. And if you see up here, I said, wolves reported killed in 2021, 2022. These are the ones that are reported. There are so many more that we don't know about. And the hunting season in Montana is from September 15th to March 15th. Last, last hunting season, 385 wolves were killed. 83, of, 83 other wolves were killed on top of that by wildlife services, which means the government killed them. In Idaho, it's July to June. Why don't they just say a whole year? I don't get that, but OK. 486 wolves were killed. We have no idea how many wildlife services killed. In Wyoming, 29 were killed. Their hunting season is shorter and it has a lot more regulations. And just is worth mentioning, Wisconsin is now on the endangered species list and was before, but in 2021, they were taken off for a very short time and they had a massacre. I'm not even gonna call it a hunt. They killed 218 wolves in less than three days. And they didn't just kill them by hunting them. They shot them with automatic weapons. They chased them with dogs, they chased them with snowmobiles. They're killing puppies in their dens and pregnant females. They had to stop the hunt before it was technically supposed to be over because they were killing them all. The ways that you can kill these guys, and again, when you think about the love they have for each other and the loss that they feel, imagine those wolves just being torn apart in, in Wisconsin, the families being broken up, the heartbreak that they were feeling. You can shoot, the, the methods of killing vary from state to state, but Here's a list of them. You can shoot them with pretty much any gun you want. You can bow and arrows, leg hold traps, which means they're traps for days until someone comes and he's supposed to expedite them with a gun. They do that sometimes, and sometimes they do worse. Snares, they choke them to death. Night hunting with night vision and thermal and infrared. That is not ethical hunting. Even hunters don't think that's ethical hunting. The use of dogs, using dogs against wolves, it's not only bad for the wolves, but it's bad for the dogs. And then, of course, aerial hunting, and that's usually government run. But like I said before, we do not know how many wolves are really dead. We don't really know how many wolves are out there because the way they count them is inaccurate, and it's an estimate. So you guys are probably wondering, why are people killing wolves? I mean, we get asked this question every single day. 
It's just bizarre. So instead of answering it, you know, the way that we normally do, we actually wanted to reach out to some of our friends and experts for their answers to share with you. Um, some of their answers were very similar or the same. So here are a few of the main reasons that these experts uh, believe that wolves are being killed, starting with Amaruk Weiss, and she's the senior wolf biologist for the Center for Biological Diversity. And she said, the North American model of wildlife management is flawed. In general, the concept that wildlife needs to be managed by killing animals. The absence of ethics training as a required part of education in American society and within agencies because exposure to such training would bring people face to face with the awareness and understanding that wolves are sentient, sapient creatures with lives of their own, families of their own, culture they pass down to future generations, and intrinsic value, regardless of what we think of them. Mark Cook, founder and president of Wolves of the Rockies said, Livestock producers, for the most part, want to graze their cattle on wildlands, put no cost or energy into monitoring them, and expect to not have any losses to any carnivores. They don't want to pay for anything that is coexistence, even if it's provided to them for free. And then Kim Bean, the vice president of Wolves of the Rockies, added, she said, I believe that this is an attack on our public lands, privatization for profit. Landowners could either exploit the land themselves or charge those who would exploit our wildlife and wildlands for profit. Casey York, president and founder of Trap Free Montana says, many wolf killers believe the myth that the government forced the wolf upon them and that they're going to decimate their elk. Then there is a specific group with disturbed and lethal hatred for wolves caused by other false beliefs that's been passed down through generations and they're determined to kill any and all wolves they can by any possible means. Then there are those who succumb to peer pressure and think wolves have to be managed so they opportunistically kill them. And then Nancy Warren, the director of the National Wolf Watcher Coalition wraps it up nicely by saying, I believe wolves are being killed both legally through hunting and illegally through poaching due to unfounded fears, myths, hatred, and misinformation. Despite our educational efforts and scientific data, there are still those who falsely believe wolves will decimate prey populations, that they're a major threat to livestock, pets, and humans, and unless they're managed, their numbers will grow unsustainable. So. Now that you've had a chance to hear what we've talked about today and learned a little bit, how do you feel about it? And what are we gonna do about it? We wanna thank the aquarium and Peter for inviting us here today. And Ian, for setting this all up and making us part of your first, first Wednesday of the year. That's really exciting, thank you so much. And a special thanks to our good friend, Samantha Atwood, and the Realist Wolves team for introducing us and setting this up for us. Thank you very much. We're gonna um, open up to some questions. I think we have a little bit of time. Um, and I think there are gonna be some amazing young people running around with microphones. So if you put your hands up, um, they will bring a microphone to you. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. I wish more people could learn about the value of animals and how they indeed are like us, hopefully. I have a question for you about taboo. What was your first indication that taboo was not something to be feared, that this was going to be an animal that could live with you as family? Whoa, that is a good question. It was just her nature. There was she, something about her nature. Well, she was very gentle when she wasn't around other animals and playful and she glowed. She was, there was an innocence there and she was only a yearling when we rescued her. So we knew that it was something that could be helped you know, that this was a learned behavior and that just with the right guidance, she just needed to learn not to be afraid. 
And so, uh, you know, it was also just a gut feeling. Really. Yeah, I think, you know, at the time, people said we were naive, people that were experts in thinking that she could be another way, but we didn't believe that, and I'm glad we were naive at the time, you know, because maybe we wouldn't have done it if we felt like we knew better, but we didn't, and, and she turned into this most amazing creature that completely changed our lives forever, and a lot of other people's. Hi, thank you for this amazing presentation and kind of like uh, validates my idea always just wallflowers just like puppies. <laughs> They're so cute and adorable. <laughs> so my question lays on, so you have rescued all these wolves uh, mostly from the ponds, which like, you know, their exotic pet trade or a uh, back house breed, if my understanding is right. So do you think there would be some behavior, major behavior um, difference between this wolves who were bred as a pet initially with the wild ones in the Yellowstone. Like, I know like it takes years for you to socialize taboo and possibly maybe longer if without taboo's help, you might uh, spend l longer time to socialize with Kona or Loki and Thor because I mean, the pack definitely helps. Uh, do you think it would be possible to socialize with a wild pack or you think there might be, I don't know, a major difference between the wild animals and the ones that bred in the house? Like, you know, for cats, um, there is a socialization period between a, between a wild cat and a house cat. Do you think that exhibits within wolves? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely, um, and, and that's very interesting because obviously, you know, a lot of these guys do have some domestic dog bred into them, which is going to create an effect. And, and there's a human influence and they're living in a society, you know, with a different species. So there is definitely that. And what we have been really um, striving to start working on is to, to make that connection, right? Especially, um, we're, we're good friends with Rick McIntyre, and we talk to him a lot about his observations in the wild. And then we do a lot of observing of, of our pack to decide, because that's something that uh, actually I would like to do as a study, but to, to, to see how similar they are and what those differences are and to take that into account. But to be honest, so far what we've observed is incredibly similar. I don't know how that would work out in regard to your question, but I do know that at this point we can we can see for ourselves that you know what Rick observes in the wild, as opposed to what we observed with captive-born wolf dogs. We do have some full wolves as well. Um, is is incredibly similar. So I think uh, I think for me to answer that when you know wolves in the wild grow up with their wild parents and and wolf dogs when they're born and full wolves that are for pets, they take them away from their parents immediately when they're really, really young and they give them to a human. And so they, they have a different kind of socialization. But I think what we're talking about in this particular talk is when we're hands off and they're together, there's a very strong similarity in the way they behave with each other. And I'm sure dogs too, when they're together. But yeah, of course, they live, you know, Thor and Loki live in our house. and you know, Riggs, who's a full wolf, can also come in our house, but he could never live in our house um, because he's, you know, he'll bounce off the walls. He still has that wild nature in him. But, you know, we didn't rescue Riggs as a puppy either, so who knows? Um, but yeah, there's, there's a definite difference for sure. Thank you. Um, thank you again uh, for just this amazing presentation and all that you do. Um, do you do any rescuing of wild wolves, like if there was an uh, injured or a uh, hurt wolf, and then rehabilitation and re-releasing, or is it only the wolf dogs? And can you also explain exactly what a wolf dog is? Yeah, sure. So, so we have two licenses, one for wolf dogs, which is USDA license, and we have a fish and wildlife license for wolves and coyotes right now. Um, we don't bring them in from the wild and rehabilitate. And, and generally, I mean, there are places that do that, 
but we would not be, there would be cases where maybe fish and wildlife have got a wolf that maybe was trapped and had three legs and they didn't feel like he was able to be released back into the wild. In that particular case, they could ask us to take them and we would legally be allowed to take them because they wouldn't be re-released into the wild. But we, our program, and maybe in the future we would think about doing some of that, we've, we've talked about it, but there are programs that, that rehabilitate animals and then send them back into the wild. We rescue captive born and captive bred, but we do have licenses for both um, because we do have some full wolves and some what we call very high content. So a wolf dog, to answer that question, is a dog, um, usually they don't breed a, well, in, in the beginning they probably bred a dog with a wolf at some point, but it's usually wolf dog to wolf dog, high content wolf dog, maybe wolf to a wolf dog, which would make them what's called an F1, meaning one parent was a full wolf. Um, Full wolves are the legally, the, the laws are different all over the country, but it's pretty much illegal in most states to have a full wolf, although it is legal in some and in some counties. So they breed wolf dogs to get around the law a little bit. Um, and so there can be low content, which we've got. She's 16% wolf, but she's like a wild dog because she's expressing a lot of her wolfy genes. And then we have you know, full wolves, and we have everything in between. So we, we mark them as low content, meaning more dog. Doesn't mean to say they're any less of a problem sometimes, because you know, they're expressing, it depends what genes they're expressing, and the dog sometimes makes it even worse and you know, makes them a little wilder than just being a wolf. And then the mid content is half and half about, and then high content is up in the 80s, 90s, and you know, towards full wolf. And we haven't really noticed that much of a difference between, you know, some high contents can be very doggy. Um, Riggs is 100% wolf and he's, he'll sit on your lap. He'd be in here right now running around sitting on your lap. He still couldn't live in your house because he's wild, but he's socialized and he's friendly and he loves people. Yet Ryder, who's 16% wolf, she's just a little wild thing. I mean, she, you know, she's the one that bites you more than anybody else, you know. So it, it really- you Notice they're all laughing. They're all laughing because they've all been bitten by her. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's, it's different, yeah. The reason that they, like he said, they breed some dog into the wolf, there were, you know, historically different reasons for it. One was that they were uh, looking to strengthen the immune system of certain breeds of dog because domestic dogs were having, you know, some problems with their health and not realizing that what, they, what the outcome was going to be. And then there was another effort uh, where they thought that they would use them as guard dogs. And That's that my favorite. The wolf would make them more aggressive, but being so shy and skittish, they just created a bunch of scared little <laughs> not good guard dogs. But today it is, I mean, if, if in many counties, if full wolves are illegal, the breeder can breed a little dog into the wolf and, and do it legally get around that it's a, a bit of a loophole hi um, I was wondering are they going to turn the lights up so that we can see them or can you bring them out oh I don't know is that possible is it possible just to yeah dim, we'll turn the lights up I don't want to like bring dim them the out lights up they... just a little bit maybe um. <laughs> <laughs> They've had a long day. Hey, buddy. Yeah, here. they traveled. We, you we live say up hi? near Palmdale, you so it was a bit hi? of a journey down. Yeah, yeah. You want to say hi? Do you guys want to come yeah. say hi so you everybody can see you? People? Yeah. Come say hi. Come, come on. Say hi. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on, guys. Oh, you're so good. There we go. Good. So this one is Thor. This is the one who took on the leadership position. And you know, it was so fascinating to us because... We really didn't know. I mean, if you think about it, we have mostly uh, an adopted pack. They're unrelated. They're from all over the country. It doesn't really make sense that they would form their own pack. Usually packs in the wild are blood-related. They're a blood-related family. So we kind of assumed that maybe it was just going to be a one-off thing with taboo, that it was something special in that moment, and it wasn't going to happen again. So when it did happen again, uh, we were really fascinated. And Thor, like he said, he has inflammatory bowel disease, and it's managed. You know, he's very sick for a long time, and sometimes he's, he's not feeling as well as he, as he could. But the minute he agreed to take on the position, 
we noticed that he started eating more, even because he would skip meals all the time, but he didn't miss a meal. He became more robust. It was like he knew he needed that strength for the position that he had agreed to take. And, uh, and then here's Loki the nanny. <laughs> <laughs> and Loki has the most epic underbite you've ever seen. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see it, but he's an absolute sweetheart. Any more questions? Uh, thank you. I just want to say a few words before we go out. Sure. Thank you. Um, Actually, all of us scientists aren't quite such, such weird. No, no. But, you know, actually, science is changing. We are, we are uh, one of the most active areas in biology is understanding that animals do have emotions and feelings. We underestimate it because we tie everything to language, right. written mm -hmm. and spoken language. Right. And yeah. because they don't have language, uh, they, we totally underestimate the richness of their lives. But there's a lot of one of the most active areas of research now in biology is getting away from that and, and designing experiments and sensitive observations to reveal the richness of their life. And yeah. All that's pretty much in the last five years. That's, that's very, very recent. Yeah. Uh, so we, it applies to many of the animals that we have at the aquarium. The other thing I would say is when you go out, uh, you have to come down to the front. There's a, Why don't you uh, guys go now? You have a drink and there's Before material the people go. to enjoy conversation. We have a uh, try to go back behind the ropes. We'll see how it goes, and if they don't like it, we'll take them back. And really digs deeply into how uh, you said it very well. It's not management; they call it management. Yeah, it's senseless. Um, there's some some material from We List Walls, which is an organization of a bunch of us who who, who care a lot about walls. But I do want to say it's not just wolves that have, have this issue. You know, there's we need to learn how to share the planet with wild animals. And uh, you know we have sea otters, we have uh, great white sharks, we have alligators. You know there we have, there's a lot of animals we have to learn P22. how to. P twenty two. P twenty two. Example, yeah, exactly. Mountain lions. So it's something that I, I feel that you know we at the aquarium uh, care about. We care about animals. We care about conservation. And I hope by thinking about wolves and sea otters, and octopus, and even lobsters in a different way, um, you know, you'll have a, a richer life and you'll appreciate nature more. Thank you very much. And I want to announce that we have two other events coming up. Our next one, very fitting, is our next first Wednesday is sea otters. And talking about um, reintroducing into the wild rescued animals. Well, you'll be learning about that, our sea otter surrogacy program and conservation program. And we also have a special thing. It's not a first Wednesday in January 25th. Uh, you can find it on our website. I don't know if you know the comedian Eliza Schlesinger. Um, very, a lot of Netflix specials, been in movies. Uh, and her husband, Noah, has just written a cookbook. And we're going to have some sort of a, a sustainable, a talk about sustainable eating, but also joy, joyful, happy eating and uh, a little bit of entertainment from Eliza and Noah and have their cookbook signed, if you want through this amazing That's cookbook cool. signed um, January 25th. That sounds cool. So thank you very much, you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You have to so <laughs> well, come down here, go out, and uh, have some conversations. Um, and some of the authors of the papers will be scheduled, will be around the table so you can talk to them, some of our young staff. This is a great paper. This is a great paper. Yeah,